Hi everyone, I'm Matt, for those who don't know me, and today I'm going to be talking about Scala in 2022 and whether I think it's still relevant. So we'll talk about Scala 3, the latest big version of Scala, Scala JS, Scala Scripting, Scala Native, which are three side projects in Scala, and then at the end I may ask, answer the question of whether I think it's still relevant. So to give you some background, in 2010, my wife was into Haskell, and then she got into Scala. She was a bit of a Martin Nadersky fangirl, and that led to me getting interested in Scala. Um, I'd already done some Haskell, but I spent about five years working at various places doing Scala. And then I got a job doing Java, and apart from side projects, not really done so much Scala since then, so I thought it would be a good idea to uh, take a look at what's going on in Scala now, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So, according to the TAB people who try to answer this question of which languages are relevant, um, Scala has 0.26% of language usage, whereas Kotlin has 0.41%, and languages like COBOL and ABAP, which I've never heard of, um, are seemingly doing better than Scala. Scala Center is the organization um, that looks after Scala. It's run out of this EPFL university in Switzerland. Um, lots of people there do PhDs and pick up a Scala project to do for their PhD. Um, it's fair to say that corporate usage of Scala is entrenched. Lots of big banks and big former startups are still using it. There's no doubt about that. Looking at Google Trends, 2016, Scala was relatively cool. You can see where it peaked. Uh, in 2022, it's really less so. Scotland's, Scotland's a cool one now. Um, lots of developers are moving to it. Lots of really keen uh, developers who are working in the ecosystem have moved there. Um, Java continues to take inspiration from Scala, and a lot of the really useful new features like perhaps um, records, lambdas, uh, took a lot, lot of inspiration for how Scala implemented them. This is a screenshot from Scala Center's uh, website showing you all the different projects that are going on. Um, there's a fair bit of technical work, but a lot of it is about uh, educating people, improving the documentation, improving processes. Um, which are addressing things that people have criticised Scala for before. Scala 3 was released in May 2021, um, and I wondered if this peak of interest here was actually the release of Scala 3. Maybe it's picking up. Um, it's a really large release. Uh, I've heard it said that because people can only release large Scala books very occasionally, it was important that they got all the changes into Scala 3 so that the books could be updated once rather than trip feeding the updates. I don't know if that's true. Scala 3 shows a trend towards simplifying everything and making it more approachable. Um, if I think about the things that made Scala difficult or pain points perhaps, I'd say it probably had an overly concept, overly complex syntax, it was too large a language. So you really had to choose your own subset that you wanted to use. The tooling was maybe not great, the compilation was certainly slow, and implicit's really confusing for a lot of people like me. Um, it includes a new compiler called Dotty, which is anecdotally much faster. Um, it has simplified implicit, it has union and intersect types, which are really cool, I might show you those. Uh, it has a Python-like syntax, so XML list rules are removed, the new keyword's optional, and there are bracket list control structures and indentation rather than braces. And you can see how I feel about that one. So really, Scala's now trying to be everywhere, moving beyond just running jars and doing scripting, uh, native support, full stack, Scala, everywhere. So the first thing we're going to talk about is Scala.js. So Scala.js has been around since 2015. 
It's a Scala transpiled to JavaScript with some really nice, lightweight, fast tooling. Um, everything seems to work, in my experience, way better than you think it would, really simply. Um, there's good integration with JS libraries. They claim it's easy. It's kind of down to opinion, for sure. Um, it has intuitive DOM manipulation. So on the next slide, you'll see that Um, it looks a lot like JavaScript, um, which is kind of the native language of the web, isn't it? So you can create elements easily by the tag, add um, classes to their class list, find elements by IDs. You can have event listeners in a very natural way, and do things like timeouts, which may be even more surprising that it seems so JS y. You can interact, integrate with React, Vue.js, and Angular. And lots of people do use these things. So why would we do this? So this is the kind of a question we'll have for all three of these plugins. But the upside is it's really Scala, just in the browser. So all the nice things about Scala, you more or less have like proper types, encapsulation, immutability, as much functional as you want. You are really writing Scala. Um, I guess the use cases are sharing code between the front end and the back end. Um, you're doing full stack, you only have to know one language, have one repo. Um, could you work this way? I don't know, but that's an idea. Um, it also integrates well with AWS Lambda. Um, so you can write your lambdas, lambdas in Scala.js, compile them to and to JavaScript, and you're writing Scala, but without the JVM performance penalties. So I have spent a little bit of time building a Wordle clone, um, because at the time I was researching this stuff, Wordle was the exciting new thing. Let's take a look at that. And this is it. And you can it's Wordle. You can say, can't think of any words now. Chimp. Hmm. Flies. Use the keyboard too. I seem to have forgotten how to play this game. Um, but it was really quite straightforward to use. I think I spent about two nights on it, so it seemed like quite good um, learning curve to me. And it's fair to say that for me, the transpiling magic really works. I didn't have to ever look at the JavaScript here under the bonnet, say. Um, yes, it's good code. So I think it's fair to say there's nothing that's strange here. We've got the state nicely here, the Scala main method, adding listeners. With lambdas, setting up the UI in a, in a very standard way. Um, there's almost not really much to show, right? So now I'd like to, like to talk about scripting in Scala. Um, a very simple level, you can. Um, okay, so nobody scripts on a JVM. I think that's fair to say. Uh, mainly because you have to wait for the JVM to start. Uh, maybe it's not so slow these days, but it certainly would have had a long term around time um, back when people were using Java to start with. You then have the uh, compile and run, or two phases to run it, two commands to run it. And there were no real dedicated libraries convenient for doing scripty things like working with files and processes, not as simple as something like Python. Yeah, so. Um, you can get around some of this by making your um, Scala file executable. Um, Scala, the, ex the program can run uncompiled code in this format, and you can use the bang thing at the top of the file to say, run it with Scala and make it executable, and then you have um, 
shell scripting with executable files. Why would you do this? Um, it's not a bash. Um, every time I go back to having to write a shell script, I have to relearn some elements of bash. Kind of painful when my starter skills are fairly fresh. Um, also, there's Python, Python replacement libraries that we'll see for doing all of the things that we wanted to do. Ammonite is a popular thing in the Scala scripting world. You can easily run scripts from the command line. You can download and import dependencies. It's part of the Howie stack. So Howie is a developer who's written direct replacements for popular libraries in Python like OS and JSON. It also has a REPL. So let's take a look at this. This is a uh, Ammonite script. At the top, you can see that it's downloading some dependencies directly. So Ammonite sees these and will sees this and will um, download those dependencies using the IV coordinates. You can give it parameters using annotations. I've just got the main annotation, um, and then we've got some Scala code, which is really clean and I'd say much more expressive than what you're likely to get. With the bash script, um, very natural to a Scala developer. So to me, this is kind of a compelling use case for the reasons I described before. Not having to reacquaint myself with bash all the time would be quite a benefit, I'd say. Now, we're now going to be talking about Scala native, and I probably should have finished these slides when I started this talk. So Scala native um, is a Scala C plugin, a plugin for the Scala compiler, which has an ahead of time compiler as opposed to a just in time compiler. So it's building an executable file in advance of when you want to run it. It takes a Scala file, turns it into something called native intermediate representation, which is the Scala thing, which is then processed into LLVM, which is a compiler writing library, um, and out of it you get OS-specific binaries, so you can choose your target architecture. So I've been looking at this book, uh, Modern Systems Programming with Scala Native by Richard Ailing. Um, some of the key features of Scala Native are that you get full control of memory layout and allocation. So you can allocate your own memory, and in that case, you could be responsible for deallocating it too. You can have low-level primitives like pointers if you want, um, and interoperability with native libraries, which I think really means C libraries. Um, and at the same time, you've got all the nice Scala features available too. So if you want, you can just write normal Scala code, and you will get an executable out at the end. Um, but the goal is to abstract all this low-level power behind idiomatic Scala APIs. Um, you can use um, most of the uh, pre-existing Scala libraries as long as they publish NIR files in their distribution, or you can build them yourself, I guess. And there are some caveats with that, which we'll talk about. This is what some of the code looks like. And to me, if I saw this six months ago, I would have thought that is C code. And a lot of it does look like C code, but this is actually Scala. So I'd say that you're really learning a new language when you're doing this to some extent. A new way of programming if you're not familiar with systems programming. Whereas with Scala JS, for example, there's probably much less to learn. So why would you do this? Um, easy deployment. So you've just got an executable file to distribute. Low startup time. Um, very, very quick startup. No JVM to start. And instant performance. No JVM to warm up. Um, hoping that there's reduced memory usage. Uh, certainly if you um, control the memory yourself. Disk, reduce disk usage because you don't have JVM all of that to store and the ability to do handcrafted performance optimization with things like the pointers. So once we have those abstractions at the C level, we do still have all the nice Scala things that we're here for, like modern garbage collector. So if you 
aren't allocating your memory, just creating objects normally. They're still a garbage collector in there for you. You can do the functional programming, you've got pattern massive matching, you've got unusable data structures, really nice encapsulation. Um, you've got very high level and very low level abstractions all in one place. As I said, this is kind of a strength and maybe also a challenge too. You can optimize the performance of your critical code sections while remaining in the Scala world. So if there's a loop that's really important to you, say, you can probably optimize that. Just that one part, but have all the rest of your code being nice normal Scala. But what are the use cases for this? Desktop, serverless, so as well as using just Scala JS to do this, you can just make an executable. And the man who wrote the book I was just telling you about has um, a library available to make this really easy. Less confidently, I'd say that you could use um, the embedded programming on it. There's no real reason not to, I guess. Um, you can compile to WebAssembly because you can compile to anything that LLVM compiles to in theory, and LLVM compile compile to WebAssembly. And mobile, there's been talk of people um, writing Android apps with this. I don't know if that's a real thing. But what are the downsides? Well, you don't have everything from Scala. You only have a subset of the Java standard, li standard library. Um, the, the team has had to re-implement a lot of it in Scala, which is a huge job. Um, libraries that don't already have the PIM files have to be recompiled and republished. Some things aren't supported, like there's no multi-threading at the moment, where I think that's being worked on. Reflection and class loading don't really make sense outside of the JVM. Um, and it says here Scala 3 supports in the works, but I believe that that is now supported. Um, you can choose your GC implementation, your garbage collection implementation, or you can even choose to have no garbage collector if that suits you. These are all kind of trading compile speed versus the runtime performance. So obviously there's alternatives to this. Rust is extremely popular now. All three of these just compiled out in native out of the box. Rust has nice um, structures for being memory safe, for example, Go, very popular C, obviously. Um, I don't know if Scala has enough to make it compete with these languages, which are really built for this use case, but we'll see.